and you're ready to go. Have a good session. Thanks a lot, Kay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto 2021 session on Applied Cryptography and Side Channels. My name is Shikhar. I am affiliated with Visa Research, and I will be chairing this session. So in this session, we will have four five-minute talks. As has been the norm, we will have the talks back to back, and then I'll open up the floor for uh, questions. So please feel free to post your questions on the thread in Zulip. Uh, I believe there's a, there's a separate thread for the applied cryptography and side channel session on Zulip where you can post your questions. You can also post your questions uh, on the chat. Thanks, Kay, for posting the link to the Zulip thread. Uh, please feel also feel free to post your questions on the chat here. Uh, but please ma make sure to mention who your question is directed to so that I know which author uh, to direct the question to. Uh, thank you, and uh, I guess we can get started. So, Sean, if you are uh, ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, looks good. Okay, uh, so, nice. Yeah, okay. So the first talk is titled Provable Security Analysis of FIDO2. This is a work by Manuel Barbosa, Alexandra Baldireva, Sean Chen, and Bogdan Warinsky and Shan will give the talk. So the floor is yours, Shan. Thanks for the introduction, Sika. So I'm Shan Chen from TU Darmstadt, and this is the joint work, as uh, Sika said, is uh, with Mao Babosa, Sasha Bodorev, and Bogdan Warinsky. So I'm sorry that this may go a little bit fast, but uh, with the, this short time, I cannot do better. OK. So let's first see the motivation here. So suppose you'd like to log into a bank account and uh, check your balance. Then in practice, you would use your computer to build a TLS channel to the bank server. And uh, this will give you server authentication and channel security. And to authenticate the, the server, authenticate the user, uh, the server may require the user to provide his uh, password through this TLS channel. And this uh, will give the uh, this will give the bank uh, user authentication. And sometimes we may also require the user to have a second factor device for strong security. So we know that passwords are very easy to use, but uh, it also has a lot of problems. So it would be good to get rid of password when the user logs in. And this FIDO2 protocol is uh, recently uh, proposed passwordless authentication standards uh, proposed by Fast Identity Online or FIDO Alliance. It involves a lot of leading companies in the world. So with this FIDO2 protocol, the user tries to log into the server through a client browser uh, with help of its authenticator device or simply we call it the token device. It could be a, a smartphone, or maybe a secret token device. Uh, so it consists of two components. The first one is called WebAuthn. It's, it's a challenge response protocol between a server and token device. So the goal is for the server to authenticate the token. So uh, in this protocol, the token somehow de uh, derives some uh, secret signing key and they register the corresponding verification key to the server as a public credential. Then the server can generate a random challenge and send it to the token through the client browser. And the token just uh, signs that challenge and generates a signature sent back to the server for verification. And the second component is called CTAP2. So it's uh, used by the user to authorize the client access to his token by binding the user selected clients to the token. So the goal is to guarantee that only the user authorized clients can have access to the token. So why we need this? Because uh, with this protocol, even if the token is stolen, the user, uh, the attacker still cannot easily impersonate the user because it will require some access, user authorized access to the token device. Uh, there were very limited uh, uh, security analysis about by the two protocol uh, previously, so we do need a comprehensive crypto analysis about by the two. So our work is focused on this, uh, focus on its authentication properties. So we first uh, define a protocol syntax and security model for the first component web also and show that it's indeed secure in our model. In practice, this means only the uh, tokens with valid attestation key, these keys are embedded by the manufacturer, can be registered to the server. And the server accepts authentication only from the tokens that register, uh, from that token that register the same credential that used in the authentication. And uh, for the second component, we, we fix another model and show that it's secure in our uh, model, but uh, in the sense that the user's token can indeed uh, only be uh, accessed by user authorized clients. 
But here, uh, unfortunately, this is um, uh, only secure in the weak sense, which means we have to assume the binding phase is trusted. So we do not allow any active attacks against the client during the binding. And we also need to assume no authorized clients to the target token can be compromised. So the reason is because CTAP2 uses unauthenticated DP Helm case change for the binding phase. And this is not that secure. So to achieve strong security, we, uh, we propose this secure protocol as PACA protocol. Uh, with this protocol, we basically use the password authenticated key chain for the binding phase, and uh, we can get rid of the restrictions. And it turns out our secure, our model, uh, our protocol is actually more efficient than the current set of two uh, protocols. So that's very good. And uh, altogether, we have this FIDE2 security from its uh, compon uh, components in a modular way. So we guarantee that to impersonate the user, uh, the attacker has to require both the uh, register token and authorized access to it. And uh, as we said, this is only in the weak sense. And if we use our strongly secure SFACA protocol, we can get strongly secure uh, new protocol. Uh, to uh, to get to use this like a strongly secure protocol, in practice, we also need to, to deal with some subtleties. So if we allow some, uh, some clients to be compromised, then we also require the user to perform some user gesture to decline the malicious access, such that only the, uh, the expected client can access the token. So this, for this uh, stronger security, we may need the uh, token device to have some display. And altogether, we have this uh, server-side security for the uh, FIDE2 protocol. So it's a uh, user authentication. And we know that uh, uh, TLS gives us uh, server authentication for the client side. So the question is like, does FIDE2 also provide user-side security if it runs over TLS? And the, the answer is yes. So to summarize our security results, we basically show that FIDE2, the current standard, uh, enjoys mutual authentication security but in the weak sense, and if we use our stronger SPACA protocol to replace their CTAP2 component, we can get strong security. Okay, so uh, thanks for, uh, for the listening. So please refer to our longer talk and our paper for more details. For example, there we also show that we improve the current CTAP2 standard and fix some design flaws without weakening security. Thank you. Uh, Sikhar, you're muted. Thanks, Kay. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot, Shan, for the wonderful talk. So uh, please please feel free to post your questions on Zulip or in the chat, and we'll take them uh, at the end of the session. Um, so now we'll move on to the next talk for this session, which is SSC and SSD, page efficient, searchable, symmetric encryption. And uh, this is joint work by Angel Boswa. Raphael Bost, Pierre Allen Fook, Brice Minot, and Michel Reichel. And I believe Michel will give the talk. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So, yeah, as, uh, as already said, I will talk about SSE and SSD, page version social symmetric encryption. And yeah, this is joint work with Brice Minot, Pierre Allen Fook, Raphael Bost, and Angel Bosua. So, as I guess not everyone is, con uh, is familiar with the notion of searchable uh, symmetric encryption, I quickly introduce the primitive. So, say and of course, uh, what it's used for. So say you have a bunch of documents um, that potentially contain conf uh, confidential information, say police records or medical information, and you want to outsource this to a um, untrusted server because potentially you don't have enough space locally. And uh, I mean, of course, you can just encrypt your information, send it to the server, and then it just lies there on the server. But in general, you want um, some type of search functionality. and um, in this case, what we want is keyword searches. So given a keyword, we want to um, access the, uh, the respective documents that contain the keywords. And uh, we do so by um, essentially when searching a keyword, um, receiving back the identifiers that match this keyword. So how does uh, SSE work um, when you want to enable this functionality? Well, basically in a setup phase, you encrypt your documents, you encrypt your index, and then you send it to the database. And then the database um, can store this information and of course, potentially, uh, or also store auxiliary information. And um, afterwards, you can uh, use this uh, functionality like the SSE functionality in order to 
search a given keyword um, by providing access to a uh, to a search token. And um, yeah, essentially the, the search token then enables the, the server to look up the, the uh, matching keywords, uh, the matching identifiers, and then he can send back the uh, matching identifiers given the token. Yeah, that's essentially how SSE works. And um, in, in general, we model the adversary as uh, uh, the server as the adversary because we want him to learn as little information about our potentially classified information as possible. So um, how does our work come into play now? Well, basically um, all of these, uh, or most uh, symmetric search, uh, search for encryption schemes use as the name says, symmetric primitives. So they have low cryptographic overhead. Um, but of course, in order to still be compatible uh, or competitive to um, non-secure databases, so like a, a, just a normal database, um, not only the cryptographic overhead counts, but also the memory access patterns and how, um, how you access memory. And actually, um, for symmetric search of encryption, this is the main overhead. And uh, the research community mainly looked at um, locality for uh, in this sense. So essentially, um, this just uh, counts the number of red non-adjacent memory locations. And uh, yeah, this is a good predictor for actually, uh, HDDs. But nowadays, actually, um, there is a lot more SSDs in, uh, in use. And uh, for this, the efficiency um, can be predicted in, in a more um, adapted way by looking at page efficiency. So the number of red pages per query. And yeah, in this paper, we first of all show, of course, that this makes sense, so that this is a good predictor for throughput on SSDs. And uh, mainly, um, or the main part is we want to construct uh, efficient SSE. So we want to have page efficient, so efficient SSE on, on SSDs. So we want to have good page efficiency. So we minimize the page access per query. We want to have good storage efficiency. So we want to minimize the server storage. And lastly, um, of course, we want normal SSE security guarantees. So we want to min uh, minimize the leakage. So essentially standard leakage for SSE schemes. Yeah, and how do we do that? Well, basically, um, we identify an underlying um, allocation problem, as is common in, in also uh, locality-based SSE schemes. And a solution to this we call DIP, so data independent packing. And what we want to do here is we have lists that match a keyword, um, or, or, or lists, um, in this case, um, uh, in different colors. And we want to allocate those to a bunch of buckets and a stash potentially. And data independence in this case means that the list location, so where we store the list in which bucket should not leak information about the length of other lists. And yeah, we model this in a purely combinatorial way. So this follows quite straightforwardly um, just by definition. And uh, how can we use this? Well, we can use this to construct SE by essentially um, using this packing algorithm in order to, essentially what we do is we identify buckets with pages, and then we can just use a DIP scheme in order to pack the identifiers um, of lists into these buckets. And uh, if we do that, essentially um, we can show that this is uh, like, this has standard leakage, so it's secure, and the efficiency um, is essentially inherited from the DIP scheme. So all that is left to do now is actually instantiate the DEP framework, which is easier said than done because that's kind of the main part of the paper. Um, but what we show is that we can construct an efficient DEP scheme based on cuckoo hashing for weighted items with stash. Um, so yeah, this is essentially a generalization of existing cuckoo hashing literature um, that also works for weighted items. And we show that um, given a stash, um, it actually has a negligible failure probability. So it, essentially you can always allocate um, your lists in such a way, even if you have no control over how your lists are distributed and only access to the total number of items. And yeah, essentially this we can use in order to construct a static SSE scheme by plugging this DAP scheme into the framework. And then we get a scheme with optimal page and storage efficiency. Um, so yeah, constant for both. And uh, yeah, that's uh, basically the main result of the paper. And if you want to learn more about the uh, result, then I invite you to check the ePrint or of course to watch the video or ask questions later. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michelle. So take questions at the end of the session or end of all the talks. So, 
So we'll now move on to the next talk. The next talk is titled Towards Ran Tight Random Probing Security. And this is joint work by Gatan Cassiers, Sebastian Faust, Maximilian Ort, and Francois Xavier Standard. And Maximilian will be giving the talk. So. Thank you for the introduction. So can you hear me? Yes. OK, perfect. So thank you for the nice introduction and welcome to our presentation towards tight random probing security. And as mentioned, it's a joint work with Gaetan Casillas, Sebastian Faust, Francois Xavier Stander, and me, Maximilian Ault. Before I want to present our results, I first want to give a quick introduction. So in the classic cryptography, we often use the black box model. Here, we assume that the adversary only learns about the input-output behavior of a cryptographic primitive. For example, the message ciphertext pair of an encryption scheme. Unfortunately, this is not the case in the real world. In the real world, the adversary can learn even more due to side channel leakage. The power consumption of a device might leak secret-dependent data, for example, the key of an encryption scheme. And the same holds for electromagnetic radiation. Therefore, we have to think about how to model those leakages to provide security proofs in this scenario. Before we can define our leakage model, we first have to think about the computational model. Here we use the arithmetic circuit, where here the operations are described as gates and all values, even the intermediate values, are carried by wires. With the arithmetic circuit, we can define our leakage model. We have chosen the P1 and probing model, originally introduced by Ishai, Zahai, and Wagner at Crypto 2003. They assume that each wire leaks with probability P. And the advantage of this model is that it's close to the real world, since it describes the continuous nature of leakage. If a value is used multiple times, it is also carried by multiple wires, and therefore the leakage increases. <clears throat> with the leakage model, we can also quickly explain how to protect circuits against those leakages. Assume we have a circuit with secret inputs A and B that computes C equals A squared plus B. To protect the circuit against leakage, we first have to secret share the secrets. So here we use an N out of N secret sharing with, a, with N equals two. Further, we want to transform the circuit in such a way that it only computes on the shares, not on the secrets directly. And finally outputs a secret sharing of our C. We can even improve this circuit or the security of the circuit by randomizing the internal computations in such a way that the correctness of the circuit still holds. You can think about a multi-party computation. It's quite similar. In our work, we wanted to analyze the security of such circuits. In detail, we are interested in the probability that the leakage of the circuit is still independent of the secret, in our case, A and B. To do this, we introduce our new approach, the prop distribution table. The prop distribution table is a matrix that contains the probabilities that the leakage of, uh, of, of the circuit depends on the special amount of information of the secrets. For example, if we can simulate the leakage with only A0, it's still independent from A and B, since it is only a share of A and therefore independent from A. Further, we explain how we can compute the PDTs efficiently. <clears throat> Here we use a Monte Carlo approximation to compute the circuits up to six shares. <clears throat> For the Multiplication, for example, we need three, 33 hours. That's the reason why we also need some other approximations. And we give composition results, how to compute the PDTs for much larger circuits. In detail, we explain how to compute the PDT of larger circuits with the help of the PDTs of smaller subject circuits of the circuit. <clears throat> to conclude, we, uh, uh, um, we, we give tighter security proofs with our new techniques. And our new techniques are generic, which means that we can apply the techniques for an arbitrary circuit. Unfortunately, we are still limited in the number of shares and we're able, only able to compute the PDTs for circuits up to six shares. 
where we have sh shared the secret into six shares. As I said, we are not fully tied. This means we had some approximation in the composition and the computation of the PDT. <clears throat> so the question is, can we improve our results to make the proofs tighter? A further open question is, can we large scale the composition? For example, in our paper, we analyzed the ISS box, <clears throat> but can we still improve our techniques such that we can compute or analyze the security of the full IS scheme? With this, I want to finish the talk and thank you for listening to our presentation. <clears throat> if you have any questions, feel free to ask live here or by email. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you very much, Maximilian, for the very nice talk. Uh, so we'll now move on to the last talk of the session which is titled Secure Wire Shuffling in the Probing Model. So, Yes, it's okay. me. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Let me try this way. Oh, I think he might have left. <laughs> oh, did we lose? I, we lost Lorenzo, is it? Uh, he does not appear to be here anymore, correct. So um, I don't know if you want to give him a minute or if you want to move on with questions and then come back to him, um, but it's up to you. Maybe we can wait for a minute. Um, otherwise, we can move on with questions. I hope he's back soon. Uh, Me too. <laughs> So while we're waiting for Lorenzo, maybe I'll uh, have, so there's a question uh, on Zulip uh, for Shan, which Shan already answered, but maybe you would like to repeat it for uh, people who may not be following Zulip or people who are on the call. So the question was, do you require identification of the token or only of the manufacturer batch, or is it enough to know that the token was made by a manufacturer on the FIDO2 list? Yeah, yes, uh, I guess, um... I hope I understand the question right. So uh, I think uh, it asks like whether or not we need the token to be kind of different for each token to uh, for authentication security work. So actually our security guarantees that uh, for each authentication, each login is only bound to the generated credential. So uh, that means even if you have like a bunch of tokens that share the same uh, attestation key, so same key that burned by the uh, manufacturer, it's still okay for different users to use different tokens to uh, to get their security. It's just that, um, well, the anonymity issues, uh, anonymity uh, properties may may change. So, if each token has different uh, uh, attestation key, then it's easy to easy for the server to distinguish well all these uh, authentication are coming from the same token. But uh, if uh, a bunch of um, a token share the same uh, same attestation key, then it's hard for the for the server to distinguish which one coming from which token. But it's more secure actually. So I guess we are still waiting for. I'm here. Sorry, guys, for okay. the interruption. Sure. No I had worries. some. Uh... We are, I think now you can see me and yes. see my screen. I can see you, we can hear Perfect. you, we can see the screen. So, sorry. sorry again, sorry. Sure, no worries, absolutely. So the last talk of this session is titled Secure Wire Shuffling in the Probing Model 
This is joint work by John Sebastian Coron and Lorenzo Spignoli. And Lorenzo will give us the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I also want, want to thank you, uh, thanks to Ma Maxilium for the perfect introduction to the, uh, to the subject. I will talk about secure wide shuffling in the rubbing model. Um, it, uh, Maximilian uh, makes my life easier. Essentially, I will talk about the ESW model uh, where they uh, introduce notions uh, against uh, side channel attacks in terms of an adversary can, uh, which can probe uh, a bounded number of uh, wires uh, within the circuit. We can divide it, uh, the, their uh, work in uh, two parts. In, uh, in the first part, uh, the authors uh, um, came out with a construction uh, through the classical, uh, now classical masking control measures. Uh, and uh, where now the, the sensible data X is manipulated uh, along the circuit as a N out of N uh, secret sharing. And uh, with the, the number of shares equal to 2T plus one, they proved to achieve uh, perfect security against the probes. The only the disadvantage of it uh, is the complexity, which is quadratic in the number of uh, uh, probes. Uh, in fact, in order to uh, improve such complexity, they relaxed in the second part a bit the definitions, making now uh, the adversary uh, winning or uh, learning some information so with uh, some small uh, or negligible uh, probability. Uh, through that and their construction, they achieved quasi-linearity. Uh, our contribution is essentially to propose you a variant of the wild shuffling countermeasure. Uh, which now will have uh, linear complexity in the random model. Uh, we also provide an implementation of it. Uh, and as you can see from the picture, uh, our control measure in some point uh, will work uh, uh, better than the classical uh, masking. So let's recall uh, we really quick uh, their construction for the statistical privacy. Uh, it works in two steps. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, applied to the original circuit, uh, uh, the classical uh, masking control measure, but now against K probes, not T, uh, where K is the security parameter. And essentially they show that uh, such uh, uh, circuit is indeed the uh, random probe insecure or average, average K is secure, uh, where now the adversary cannot probe the uh, the, the wires he wants, uh, rather than uh, essentially each, uh, each wire leaks with some probability P. Now, uh, as a, sorry, as a second step uh, to make the security in the, in the worst case, um, essentially they uh, expanded the, the, the intermediate circuit C prime in a sort of sparser one, C prime prime, where essentially each wire uh, of, the, of C prime is replaced with a new set of L wires where all of them will, uh, will have some dummy values, uh, but for one. Uh, this one will, uh, of course, take care of the original signal uh, VI. So the issue here uh, to process the gates, uh, it, somehow uh, one uh, uh, must to put the signals, uh, the, the inputs of the gates, uh, uh, VI and VJ, in two consecutive position in the new, in the final circuit, uh, C prime prime. Uh, in uh, ES that view paper, uh, they use the, the sorting network, a sorting network, which has complexity L log L. So the overall cost of the old circuits will be a big O of the number of gates and uh, M, sorry, uh, times T log T to ensure security, of course, against now T probes. The average case was just an um, uh, intermediate phase. And essentially, uh, that's where uh, our contribution uh, uh, takes place. Uh, we, we thought to replace uh, the sorting network uh, with uh, a cyclic sheet, uh, where now the delta depends on the um, index uh, uh, J and J prime taking care of the original signals. Uh, and we'll have the, the effect that at the end of the cyclic shift, um, both the, the, the inputs uh, will lay on the um, same position J prime prime, we, we call the shuffling index. Uh, the, um, the security proof will be based on, on the fact that yes, now, uh, because sorry, I didn't um, told you that, that now to, to achieve that, uh, the index uh, J and J prime will be explicitly computed. That's one of the main difference with, the, with their construction. Uh, 
um, for, for them, it was implicit. Now we have to uh, make it explicit. Uh, that's maybe an advantage for the adversary. Uh, but the security proof uh, will uh, rely on the fact that uh, we are in the stateless model. So the adversary has to choose the, the, the whites uh, uh, in advance. And uh, NJ is computed and uh, running time. So when the adversary learn uh, the position J and J prime, it's now too late, uh, or the you know, shuffle in the index J prime prime, it's now too late um, to move the proofs and actually take advantage of it. Uh, of course, as I told you, um, the cyclic, cyclic shift has a complexity uh, big O of L, linear. Uh, so the, the, the overall uh, uh, time complexity um, of, the, of the protocol will be the number of gates time t. As a final contribution, we also <clears throat> provided a construction for the stateful model, where essentially uh, we will treat every memory cell uh, passing through a, a classical cyclic uh, shift. And uh, as the picture is showing you, uh, this uh, randomized network uh, um, that makes uh, to, to save a quadratic factor of all uh, the, the overall complexity. Uh, in fact, for every uh, memory cells, uh, the, the, the time complexity will be uh, again T log T. And the proof essentially will be based on the fact that at the end of the randomizing network, the output index will randomly distribute it. And so the, the privacy will be guaranteed. Uh, so to conclude, essentially, we, we um, propose a first improvement for the second part of the ESW model, the word shuffling control measure, uh, which is practical. Um, if you exclude the embedded uh, systems uh, and as a so, somehow a cross, uh, crossover point around uh, six uh, uh, hundreds. And I think, thank you very much. I have concluded my presentation. If you feel free to, to uh, ask any question and thank you very much for uh, hearing it. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. So now we have had all the talks in the session. So now I would like to uh, open up the floor for our questions. Um, so please feel free to post your questions on, on Zulip or in the chat, or you can also you know, just unmute yourself and uh, ask questions. Um, so uh, it seems that uh, there is a question on Zulip uh, for Maximilian. Uh, which I believe Cassius has answered, but maybe Maximilian, you would still like to address it for people here. So it asks, is there some connection between the bounded moment model and the new uh, probing distribution tables? Yeah, as a co-author of, of Maximilian, I'll answer. Okay. Uh, the short answer is there is no direct link except like the, the link we have uh, traditionally between the bounded moment model and the threshold probing model. There you have a link between basically the lowest leaking order of moment in the bounded moment uh, probing model is the same as the threshold probing model. And then between the threshold probing model and noisy leakage model, there you have a, again the link that basically uh, the security order in the threshold probing model will give you information about how the security will be a for asymptotically low uh, value of the P parameter for the noisy leakage model. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I don't see uh, any more questions on Sulip at the moment, uh, but please feel free to post your questions on the chat. In the meantime, uh, I had a question uh, to the second speaker, uh, Michelle. Um, on the SSE uh, scheme. So uh, my question was that you mentioned that uh, you know you, your scheme uses a stash on the client side. Um, and as far as I know, uh, most of the lower bound results on you know the efficiency of, uh, of you know locality preserving SSE uh, usually doesn't consider that the client has an additional stash. So do you think this somehow, uh, affects the lower bounds and makes it easier maybe to construct schemes that can you know be more efficient or um, or is it just some is it a, is it a lower bound that stays irrespective of whether or not you have a stash yeah. Of uh, yeah I think that the lower bounds are uh, with respect to no stash but um, 
yeah, I think the fact that we can get optimality here is first of all, I mean, you can see this partly uh, because we don't have a stash, but secondly, it's also because we look at a different notion of efficiency, which is actually, um, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's, it's, it has connections because I mean, in the same, we also look at, um, at a way to, to essentially store document identifiers close by, but uh, it's slightly more relaxed because it doesn't have, like, they only need to be in the same page. So not directly next to each other. Um, so yeah, I think those two points make it uh, possible. Um, but yeah, I don't have. So yeah, it, it's essentially in cuckoo hashing. It's I think it's it's kind of the main uh, the main hashing algorithm that allows for off one, and while being data independent. Um, and there, I think generally you need a stash. So um, yeah, I guess that's why. Uh, that's why the stash is necessary. And I suppose that, uh, yeah, um, I think it's not uh, directly, uh, like it doesn't directly um, imply a, a similar result in the locality case, but yeah. So uh, I'm not sure whether the lower bound still hold in the locality case or not uh, with a stash or not, but at least in this case, like uh, for patch efficiency, um, it seems to make a difference, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I had one more follow up question. So you mentioned about the data independent packing being the main sort of technical. Uh, sorry, there seems to be some noise. Uh, not sure where it's coming from, but. Um, Okay, so maybe I'll just go ahead. So, so you mentioned about the data independent packing being one of the main technical tools. And if I understand it involves uh, some amount of uh, pre-processing at the client side before the yes. encrypted database is outsourced. So could you yes. maybe expand a little bit on how this scales with the size of the database? Uh, so essentially it, it boils down to a max flow computation. So the pre-processing can, I mean, there's for example, uh, max flow computations, I think in like N to the three divided by two. So that's kind of the scaling. I think the implementation that we provide in the papers with a flow computation in credit, uh, credit, quadratical time. So it has quite the overhead, which makes it uh, less uh, attractive if you want to uh, apply like an, uh, if you want to apply a transformation for the dynamic case, for example, because you need a lot of pre-processing. Um, but uh, yeah. Essentially, this is a one-time pre-processing in the in the static case, so it's not, yeah, you know, in the static case, it, it's okay. And uh, using a more efficient flow computation can be lower, but yeah, that's true. That's one of the caveats of using the scheme. In practice, it would be like a very high um, pre-processing phase, but it's one time. So um, in turn, you get really efficient search queries, essentially, and no, basically no uh, storage overhead, like a storage overhead of two plus epsilon. Okay. Cool. And maybe one last question. So regarding the client stash, so does the stash size grow linearly with the size of the database or is it sublinear or? Actually, it's independent of the size of the database. So um, if you're careful in these, in the analysis of the, like that's kind of the main part. If you're careful in the analysis, then you can actually show that it's, um, yeah, that, that if you do the analysis with respect to the security parameter, then you can actually show that it, um, that it kind of depends on the sec uh, security parameter and it depends on the stash uh, on the page size. Um, ah, so it grows I with a higher page size, mm -hmm. but it, um, it actually scales logarithmically, um, like inverse logarithmically with the size of the database. So this higher the size of the database, um, the better distributed, I mean, the more randomization essentially mm -hmm. you have and, uh, or entropy and the lower actually your stash size will be. Okay, awesome, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much for the clarification. Um, so we have uh, a question for Lorenzo uh, on, on Zulip, uh, it basically, which says, uh, could you please give an example uh, for the cross point of um, uh, the number of probes equals 6,000? Uh, for instance, uh, when you are implementing masked AES or masked present? Sorry, can, can you repeat the question, sorry? Sure. An example uh, of. Uh... So, so the question basically asks for an example. Uh, 
So when exactly, I guess the question means that when exactly is the cross point uh, number of probes equal to 6,000? So is this the case when you are implementing mass AES or maybe would it change, for example, if you were implementing some other block cipher like mask present? Yes, I, I think it will change. We all implemented the, the IES. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a table in the, in the um, uh, paper with the exact uh, amount, which I cannot remember. But yes, uh, definitely is customized on the fact that we implemented the IES uh, rather than, for example, uh, the ES. Uh, but I think the crossing point will change according to the, uh, the protocol uh, which is applied. Uh, we didn't try, um, but I'm pretty sure that it will change. Okay, thank you. So maybe I had a follow-up question for you, Lorenzo. So, so uh, could you comment a little bit on the depth blow-up of your technique? Uh, uh, yes, uh, but in, in the end, uh, it will be um, a polylog. Uh, for example, for the psychic shift, um, it, it will be a sort of logarithmic. Uh, uh, it will not uh, really um, uh, influence or uh, be, be play a big part uh, of it. Actually, we'll uh, save something uh, in, the, in the complexity we, I told you. Uh, I exposed you, uh, essentially, we uh, the factor K is hidden. Uh, we actually save a bit. Uh, I think for the ES, uh, it's around uh, a factor of K to the 10. It's hidden. Uh, we will reach uh, uh, K to the 9, or K to the 7 for the stateless, I think. I cannot remember uh, correctly. Uh, but yes, it, it will not impact uh, much in, in our uh, analysis. Okay, thank you. Oh. Thank you very much for the clarity. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess we are nearing the end of our uh, allotted time. Uh, so this is the final call if there are any more questions. Otherwise, please feel free to post them offline on Zulip. And I believe the authors will be uh, happy to, to answer them. Uh, okay, so we have one last question maybe that we can take before we wrap up. So there's a question for Lorenzo, which says, does the leakage probability matter for the cross point? Uh, does the leakage probability matter? Uh, oh, I will say I will say no. I will say no. We also uh, provide an improvement for uh, for the p used uh, in the random probability model. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, you can uh, text me, send uh, an email. Uh, maybe I can give you whoever uh, ask uh, a better explanation. Uh, right now, I will say no, but I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure. I'm pretty sure, but um, maybe maybe I can check a, li a bit better and discuss with the, uh, whoever uh, asked. But to answer to everyone, I will say no. Okay, awesome. Uh, that sounds great. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thank you very much. Um, so if there are any more, no more questions, uh, then I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers in this session. And uh, thank you very much.